Um, so moving on, uh, our next topic we'd like to discuss today is South Korea. Uh, so with the collective West's keen interest in Georgian democracy, you would be forgiven for thinking that democracy was flourishing in the American sphere of interest. Um, if so, you would probably have been very surprised to hear that the president of South Korea, Mr. Yoon suk Yeol, declared martial law last week. Uh, this took me by surprise. I don't know about you, Pascal. Last week was crazy. Last week was, was you know, um, this one, Syria, uh, the protests in Georgia. Like, there were so many things happening that kind of, you know, had certain precursors, especially Syria and Georgia, sure. But this one? came out of the blue and and they all blew, they all blew up more, more or less at the same time um korea has had a, a history of has a history of problems with their presidents that's why a lot of them either end up dead or in prison uh mm -hmm. but this one is such a was such a i would say dumb move um that really you must wonder what how he thought that this would go down although we we will talk probably um how this developed yeah, because absolutely. had it not had it not been resolved so quickly it might have gone the other way but let, okay let's discuss that yeah it's it's just one of those stories that you see and you're like what he did what where <laughs> you know it's it just sort of beggars belief um but i think maybe the best explanation for this i don't know if you've heard about the idea of drunken fist or drunken master politics so there's this Chinese martial art called the Drunken Fist, which is about being a, looking like you're completely drunk, absolutely plastered, staggering around and swaying and so on, but actually having really good balance and being very well positioned so that you can land a surprise knockout blow just when your opponent least expects it. And, uh, and I think Trump has often been cited as a drunken master of politics, same with Boris Johnson, Nigel Farage in Britain, and... We'll see. Yun Suk Kyol also is from this sort of populist drunken master school, um, but I think the lesson here is that maybe sometimes the drunken masters of politics are just master drunks, uh, because this seems like a completely self-defeating move. And we'll get onto what happened and, and why he may have done it uh, in the next few minutes. So at 27 minutes past 10 in the evening, Korean time last Tuesday, soldiers, police and special forces took over much of Seoul and attempted to secure the parliament buildings, including the National Election Commission. Uh, in footage, you can see things like helicopters landing on futsal pitches in Seoul. You can see mass protests of Koreans going out on the street to quite rightly protest against this genuine attempted takeover of their democracy. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, yeah, you don't expect to see scenes like this in your parliament building. This is not the sign of a democracy where things are going well, is it? No, no, this is this is the kind of pictures that if they come to you from the United States, you know that they will talk about this for their, for four, five, six, seven years and 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 uh, and call it a coup. But here the United States was suspiciously uh, silent on when this happened. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, absolutely. You could see it, it seems like this. You, there was a quote from Blinken, but I think, to be honest, the US State Department was probably as much caught by surprise as everyone else was, because this is not the sort of thing that you expect to happen. Obviously, the president was trying to keep everything as secret as he could, even though there were voices in the Korean parliament saying he's going to declare martial law. Watch out, guys, about three months before. Um, I probably wouldn't believe those politicians either because it just sounds so far-fetched, but maybe not far-fetched enough. Um, so yeah, the announcement led to mass protests on the streets of Seoul and other cities. There was a quorum of senators that physically forced their way into the parliament building, National Assembly, to revoke martial law. Uh, and before the night was over, President Yoon had ended martial law. Uh, I think it was about half past five in the morning, so about seven hours the whole thing lasted. Yeah crazy i think oh, yeah. it's it, it sorry uh, carry on uh, even his own uh, party didn't support this move apart from uh, it seems they were split half and half probably between an inner circle and an outer circle um, the country's now seeing widespread strikes across multiple sectors calling for his resignation the national assembly tried to impeach him but failed a couple of days ago the vote uh, didn't go through um and yeah so i think we need to give some a bit more context about what South Korea is like as a country to try and 
put the picture to where a seemingly very successful OECD country has come to the point of an attempted coup. A coup by um, its own president, which is which is really, I think, uh, uh, not maybe not unheard of, but it, I, I'm hard it's I'm not, hard pressed to find, to there find is an a, example. There is a term for for this kind of coup. I can't remember what it's called. Not a caretaker coup or a revolving door coup, but there is a, a particular type of coup where a sitting president attempts to do it. It's happened multiple times. I think uh, even going back to 1860 in France, the transition of Louis Napoleon to Napoleon the Third, you could argue, was that kind of. Thing. But there's plenty of examples of it, and it seems the logical progression for a successful politician. And South Korea, as well, has its own precedent. The um, yeah, and I think one of the one of the facts of that night that's really important is that uh, these lawmakers, 190 of them, were able to force their way back into parliament because the reason the reason the president well after right after declaring martial law ordered his military to surround the parliament building is that within the constitution of Korea, the only uh, like a uh, body, political body that can that can undo a, a martial law decree is parliament, right? So he mm -hmm. actually tried to to prevent the, the, the people with the power to do so from meeting. Now, luckily, they failed and these people were able to smash uh, windows and get in anyhow and actually get the entire IT working, right? They recorded it mm -hmm. and they broadcasted it, um, how the gavel went down on the on the resolution that would uh, on the on the on the act that would uh, undo that decision, which then I mean, meant that at that point, the 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 democratic legitimacy or the legitimacy that you know the president has the power to declare martial mm -hmm. law but parliament can take it away and by by parliament being able to do that um it was basically it was basically now now an illegal act right and it seems that at this point the dude decided that mm -hmm. uh okay i'm going to stand down i i kind of lost the 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 race the race for um like locking things down um and because of beyond yeah, that i agree so parliament has the only de jure power to stop martial law but i don't think the korean the south korean people would have stopped at de jure i think they would have protested this long and hard and it would have, they would have overturned it but perhaps more violently and more bloodily than, yeah. than actually happened so i think probably quite a few lives may have been saved by the parliament getting up in the mm -hmm. middle of the night to storm their own Parliament building and uh, yeah. repeal this law. Yeah, no, but it's it's very the optics is very very important, right? If the president had been able to say like I did everything within the the framework of the constitution, it would have been much easier for him to gain also support from like let's say I mean to to convey the message to Europe and the and the US that this is now absolutely necessary and everything has its order, right? It's orderly, mm -hmm. it's not chaotic, it's orderly. And right now, these these violent protesters, they, um, you know, um, they are the terrorists. But by Parliament being able to de jure undo the decision, um, he lost even the narrative battle immediately. Right. Not just the support mm -hmm. from from the people. And I I guess my, because he waited, he waited until that was over in order to to take take the, the martial law back himself. Um, so might have gone another route had these people not been able to force themselves into the parliament building. Yeah, of course. But uh, so I want to talk a little bit about South Korea, just to paint a picture of the country of people who mm -hmm. perhaps haven't followed it closely. So I briefly lived and worked in South Korea for a major smartphone company that shall remain nameless. Um, and uh, it's a very interesting place. Uh, have you spent much time in South Korea at all, Pascal? I visited only twice, but never long enough to actually uh, say anything of substance about its society or so. Mm -hmm. So I think the real question is, why are things so bad in South Korea that we have this attempted coup? And just as you see this picture that's been up on your screen for a little while, by all of the logic of neoliberalism, South Korea is one of the biggest winners of the American world order. I just compare it to the North, right? It makes your case for it. After a horrendous 20th century of colonization, war, famine, poverty, and dictatorship, South Korea experienced the miracle on the Han River, which saw massive economic growth and the worldwide export of Samsung smartphones, Hyundai cars, LG TVs, and so on. South Korea successfully catapulted past the middle income trap, and uh, which so many countries fall into, and established a thriving high tech sector which is the envy of much of the world. I mean, if Europe could make smartphones like South Korea does, despite having like 10 times the population or more, uh, I think we'd be in a much better place, but we don't and we can't. 
and South Korea can. Uh, South Korea also has a global cultural presence through things like esports, K-pop, K-drama, and so on. Are you into any uh, K-pop or K-dramas? Has, has any of those seized your attention, Pascal? <laughs> Never, but I'm not a very cultured person in 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 general. I just don't I just don't watch or listen to a lot of stuff. I'm very boring in front of my little computer. <laughs> I but, wouldn't say that. But I people. admire I ad, I ad, I admire the cultural output. It's it's beautiful. <laughs> yeah, I, th I think it's pretty impressive, and uh, I always like to see new places just sort of standing forth on the world stage with their cultural outputs because there's new perspectives and new ideas that, that come forward there that you just wouldn't encounter elsewhere. And while I was in Korea, even without subtitles, you'd put a Korean drama on the TV and you'd sort of be hooked by it, even though you knew you understood about 5% of what was going on. So they're very well made. Um, anyway, so despite all of this economic success, why is it that South Korea perhaps doesn't feel like a success story when you're in it? And I think that's a really important point to make. Well, if you ask me, uh, the main reason is the sort of corporate capitalism that you have in South Korea. Uh, the successes of Korea have largely accrued to a small number of family-owned mega corporations, places like Samsung, which makes up 20 to 30 percent of South Korea's entire GDP, uh, giving them huge power and influence over society and government. Inequality has also surged, and this has been brought to the big screen by famous Korean films you may have seen, like Snowpiercer and Parasite the first foreign film to win an Oscar, uh, the, sorry, to win the best picture Oscar. Uh, anxiety is also at an all-time high as children are forced to cram study for long hours to pass standardized tests during what seems to be the first 18 to 30 years of their lives, depending on what level of education they leave the education system at. Uh, and rising living costs coincide with a catastrophic drop in the country's birth rate, which could, by the worst accounts, um, potentially make South Koreans virtually extinct within three generations. So none of that sounds like a success story to me. If we have a population pyramid here, um, which is a very normal, I think, for OECD countries, this dramatic decline in birth rates. And uh, from Statista, you can see the absolute birth rate is down to about 0.7 per woman, whereas, of course, replacement is about two. And that's really is it lower in Japan? Yes, I oh, think wow. it might be the lowest in the world. It's really, really low. And yeah, the South Korean birth rate hasn't been at two since about 1983. It's these are really, really shocking numbers. It might just look like a little line on the graph, but this is possibly more shocking even than the martial law story in the grand scheme of things. Uh, I don't know whether it's related to this or not, but the gender divide in Korea is bitter and rancorous. Extreme feminist movements are exceptionally anti-children and anti-male, while misogyny in Korea ranges from a sort of old-school Confucian chauvinism to creepy stalking, harassment and assault from improperly socialized men. And you'll see this sort of issue is all over Korean social media. The country tends to be very materialist, which further contributes to social competition and anxiety. And the surging popularity of religious cults, including Christian ones, seems to do little to undermine this materialism. If you're not convinced that there can be such a thing as a capitalist dystopia, I think South Korea might change your mind. Why am I talking about this? Well, it's in reaction to all of these developments that President Yoon came to power. He led the People's Party, still does. Uh, he presents himself as a Trumpian populist figure, and he blamed the problems of the country on things like the excesses of leftism and portrayed himself as the man to sort out the radicals, like the feminists and so on, and restore common sense to a country that in its own way had gone mad. Um, and of course, he has not succeeded. He's been probably the least successful populist politician to come to power in an OECD country. And he has stiff competition when the likes of Boris Johnson are running against you. Um, uh, so yeah, like Trump, he positioned himself with the people in a way that bitterly alienates the middle class establishment and especially the media. And like Trump, I think his misunderstanding and misdiagnosis of many of this country's problems have resulted in no structural improvements being made, just this sort of deadlock. Um, I suspect that South Korea's social problems can be attributed to its adoption of American ideas in a kind of turbocharged form compared to other OECD countries. Everything from capitalism to anti-capitalism, everything from materialism to identity politics, you'll find it just seems to end up in Korea very quickly and in a very radical form. And I think that's just far too great an engine for one lunatic in the blue house like President Yoon. 
to dismantle. Um, so in the last election in 2022, President Yoon's party lost the Senate and lost the House by a landslide, and that's made him a, an almost completely powerless president ever since. So why declare martial law, though? Why now? And what prompted this extreme move? And the BBC headline here, I think, says what everyone is thinking. What was he thinking? What's the plan here? Um, and I think there's there's a lot of arguments you can make here, but as you alluded to at the start of this podcast, I think the nature of South Korean politics does make this kind of thing more likely. In South Korea, lots of former presidents find themselves facing criminal proceedings after they leave office. Uh, South Korean politicians tend to have a lot of influence over the courts. So if you're not in power and your enemies control the courts, then you're very likely to end up in prison or worse, I think. Um, yeah, and I mean, it's it's quite ironic because he himself came to prominence of being a prosecutor, right? And and prosecuting the past previous president. Uh, um, what was her name? Um, Park. Uh, Park uh, Geun-hye. Park Geun-hye. Um, and, and, and of course, branding himself as a strongman, right? And a pro, a pro um, uh, law, law and law enforcement guy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> And then ending up declaring martial law, wanting to be an even more a stronger strongman figure, but um, just basically completely misjudging the mm-hmm. um, the impression this leaves on on everybody, including his own party. That's um, that's a pretty big deal. It is crazy, isn't it? And I think President Yoon has made an astounding number of enemies, even for a South Korean politician. And even before declaring martial law, just with the way that he presented himself on the South Korean political stage. Um, so perhaps he saw the imposition of martial law as a gamble, like a, a crossing of the Rubicon, Yapta Alia Est, a roll of the dice, succeed, and he's the next Park Chung-hee, who was dictator of South Korea for 17 years and has a, a mixed legacy. Uh, as you can well imagine, because he's often held as responsible for building the major highways between Seoul and Busan, which are argued to have catapulted South Korea's economic revival. But he was also a brutal dictator, so uh, whose main influence was training as an officer under the Japanese fascist occupation in the 1930s. So obviously a very divisive figure. Um, unfortunately for President Yoon and other players of the great Game of Thrones, the stakes are very high. Uh, it's also worth noting this is the 17th time that martial law has been declared since the foundation of the Republic in 1948, which well, is quite a lot. 17th, well. Wow. Yeah, uh, I think it gives you an idea of what the dictators were like before 1987 democratization. And even though the worst appears to be over, this is a frightening moment for South Korea. The president actually ordered the arrests of three party leaders, including the leader of his own party. Which is <laughs> never a good sign. That doesn't signal I, that you're a broad consensus building politician, does it? I'm really glad this failed. I mean, <laughs> thinking about what he was already planning to do really leaves you with a very, very frightening picture. And that's why so many people were on the streets, right? This is this is nothing mm-hmm. that the South Koreans want to ever see come back. Uh, this these dictatorships it's often forgotten you know because in the in uh, the international media um, South Korea is always compared with North Korea and it's always emphasized mm-hmm. that North Korea is a horrible dictatorship whereas South Korea is a, is, a, is a flourishing democracy and right now it is a flourishing democracy and a working one but it wasn't until the 1980s I mean these these, these leaders were um, just as brutal as their mm-hmm. northern counterparts um especially during and right after after the the korean war um mm-hmm. so this this is very very dark memories and a lot of people um, in their 60s 70s would remember those days right um yeah absolutely um no and i think it's also worth pointing out that it's not just the korean people but also the korean military that i think we have to thank for the failure of this coup attempt because reading between the lines from all the information and the interviews coming out it seems like the military had no interest in overthrowing its own democracy. And so they dragged their feet on the way to their assigned locations. There are stories of, of some units sort of stopping off uh, rests and a bite to eat and so on and so forth numerous times on their way to their targets, like the National Election Commission, uh, in order to prevent an efficient seizure of power. The military also allowed 
lawmakers to come in. They didn't fire on any of the protesters, even though they were apparently issued live ammunition, according to some photos. Um, and so, uh, yeah, it's very important to note in cases like this that if you don't have the loyalty of the security forces to do what you want to do, then you're likely to fail. Um, but if they did have the loyalty of the security forces, this could have gone, as you say, a completely different way. Yeah, and you can you can tell that he was extremely nervous about this um, critical moment, and luckily uh, it failed because, like, um, if you feel confident about political decisions, you don't take them at ten thirty p.m. <laughs> when you, when everybody goes to sleep, right? So I think one of the surprises probably was that people didn't go to sleep and wake up the next morning to the new realities, but that this spread like a wildfire, this this news, and that people took it serious and and took and took to the street actually, uh, and the lawmakers. They, I mean, I, I I just imagine like if I was a, a lawmaker in South Co in in South Korea, and suddenly at at tw uh, ten forty five my phone rings and somebody telling me you've got to go to the parliament right now. The, the loon mm -hmm. has declared uh, a martial law. I would I would be really I would his be name's really Yoon, not loon, but yeah, yeah. Sorry, I said loon, uh, <laughs> yeah, like as lunatic. Yeah, I mean he lunatic, is, that yes. is a lunatic move. But <laughs> yeah, exactly. well, that's uh, and 190, 190 of them managed mm. to get back and did that. I mean, uh, tip to the hat to these uh, to these lawmakers. Yeah, I, I think so, and uh, obviously applaud it all around for South Korean democracy, the South Korean people in general for standing up to this and preventing yeah. nonsense from, from taking place. I think that's the probably the big headline here. Um, another thing I wanted to mention as part of the context to this is the Korean doctor strike or the Korean medical crisis, as it's called. So this is another thing which is uh, important to understanding the Korean context. But Korean doctors have been striking and protesting since the start of this year. And this is a, a major thing, one of the things that President Yoon announced in his martial law declaration was that all the doctors must return to work by, I think, the 4th or the 5th. Um, this is a whole saga and probably worthy of its own podcast. And also actually understanding how the Korean medical system works is as easy as understanding how any country's medical system works, because it's a gigantic organization which millions of people rely on, which employs all sorts of specialists and equipment and so on, and has its own internal rules and pressures. And so I think the best we can provide is a relatively surface level look at the whole issue. But the core contention that the doctors have against the president in this case is that the president wants to train 5,000 doctors a year instead of 3,000. So he wants to almost double the amount of new doctors who are trained. That on the surface doesn't seem like something that's worthy of protest, but it's when you start looking into the details that it gets a bit more murky because Korea has a mixed private public health system and it's one of the most effective and most cost effective healthcare systems in the OECD. It's a really interesting case. The problem is the reason it's so successful and so cheap is because doctors essentially work overtime all the time. Uh, Korean doctors work between 80 and 100 hours per week. Crazy. Which is crazy. It's absolutely crazy. They also wonder why the birth rate is low when they're working 80 to 100 hours a week, but that's another another issue. Um, I mean, uh, you can imagine the levels of burnout yeah. from that. It but then ridiculous. it is but then it is the doctors who actually oppose the increase of the number of doctors. Yes, uh, they impose they oppose increasing the number of doctors who are trained and they also oppose bringing in lots of foreign doctors which would be the other way to remedy the staffing shortfall. And you would think that would help the doctors out by reducing their hourly workload. But I think the contention from the doctors is that, well, they've got to train these people, they've got to take them under their wing. And knowing how Korean society works, where it's very sort of not quite master and apprentice, but you very much have, in the West, the boss is sort of at the top of the pyramid, looking down on everyone else. In the East, he's very often depicted underneath everyone, holding everyone up. And so there's a very different kind of relationship between superiors and people they're training. And I expect that there are legitimate concerns by doctors that they will just have a greater workload imposed on them trying to train these new people. Uh, so that's one argument. But then I also suspect that perhaps this has something to do with the fact that the doctors are themselves an upper middle class uh, a segment of society which is sort of very diametrically opposed to President Yoon and all his works 
And you do wonder how much influence that plays in the whole decision to protest so vigorously. You know, it's very interesting. I don't know about this, the, the, the Korean, um, the, the arguments of the Korean Doctor Association, but we have a very similar dynamic over here in Japan with the Nurses Association. The Japanese government from like 10 years ago already had the idea of increasing nurses because nurses work themselves to death. Like it's very similar, mm -hmm. like the nurses shortage in, in all of the hospitals and, and, and care homes. Horrible a shortage on nurses. And the Japanese government wanted to remedy that by bringing in some highly trained nurses from the Philippines, from, from Indonesia and so on. And in the end, the organization that opposed that the most was the Nurses Association with their main argument that the influx of more nurses would depre would um would depress the salaries of the mm -hmm. of their members right so um it's uh, it's very paradoxical but uh, the the these labor unions um mm -hmm. often at, at least at least in the healthcare sector um, also here they oppose increase uh, like policies to increase the number of workers um uh, yeah, and we see that in Britain as well. We've had junior doctor strikes and so on about the very same issue, increasing the number of doctors who are trained or bringing in more doctors from abroad. Now, I, you can't dismiss that point, though, because, of course, when you when you increase the labour supply from abroad, then you do decress, depress local waste, wages, whatever the industry is. That's that's almost law of economics there. Yeah. But, um, but the problem is that doctors are overworked at the point yeah. uh, the system allows encourages and in fact pressures them to work until they drop and that's that's just not yeah. a fair system that's uh, the other thing system. to point out is that all of the oecd countries are competing for this limited pool of doctors who they want to attract from the third world which will then deprive those areas of proper medical provision yeah. so it's not and really doing the world a favor no, no, it's not. And and Europe is a wonderful example, you know. And um, Switzerland actually stands on the on the on the, on the peak of that, right? Switzerland has a shortage of medical uh, staff, and it takes uh, doctors and nurses from Germany. The shortage in Germany is then made up by Poles, and the shortage in, po in Poland is made up with Ukrainians. And Ukraine is well, is now in a horrible war situation. And, mm -hmm. uh, anyhow, I mean, it is is always the the lowest level of income uh, countries that then that then get even more disproportionate burden. But that's beside the point, because the point is that we also within uh, um, uh, countries uh, of the global north and so on, you ha you sometimes often find these dynamics where. Um, where the political process might want to remedy a bad situation, but it can be the very people caught in that situation who who then oppose that for different reasons, and thereby you get mm. a political deadlock. But and it seems that Korea is in um, in somewhat a similar situation with the doctors. Huh? Yeah, I think so. There are no easy answers here. Uh, the whole political process seems very acrimonious, uh, even before the martial law declaration. And so it's hard to see a good solution coming here. But to be honest, the people I feel sorry for here are the doctors and nurses who yeah. are just being worked to death by this system. And uh, and that's the problem that needs to be solved. So I think we'll conclude this story um, on this note. So there was an impeachment vote against him, which failed. He managed to gather enough support from his own party, despite attempting to arrest their leader, um, yeah. to survive the impeachment vote. And uh, apparently the party has extracted a promise from him that he will step down at some point. Uh, some of his opponents are still claiming that he will try martial law again because it's the only way he can survive. Um, but even if he did, he would surely fail. Um, uh, the defense minister has also resigned. I don't know if we've mentioned that yet. The defense minister actually went to the same school as the president, which is why they're called the Chungam faction after the high school they both served at. There's just another example of how these close sort of personal connections are important in politics. Uh, he's resigned and has been arrested on corruption charges, but it seems the party are trying to scapegoat him. I don't think they'll succeed. Um, yeah, no, I think that's it for today for our coverage. Do you have anything to add just to conclude that, Pascal? Um, well, nothing nothing of, of substance at this point it's just that it's another example of um how how quickly things can go south even in places that are relatively calm and you know when we talk about north and south korea we usually um worry about the security situation but also internally um even in the in the global north i mean north uh, south korea together with japan counts to the western club of the world right mm -hmm. um 
maybe this is this is one of these signs that also locally here things are not are not are not as stable as they seem and the um the political process also if we look at you know the opposition to certain of these um entrenched elites in europe like what's happening the the vote in bulgaria uh, not bulgaria sorry romania, romania so on and uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of problems brewing under the lid and i do think that um leaders from from like the, the parties that are used to govern the global north are getting mm -hmm. jumpy about about um not not having that much support anymore and um as before so uh, i would expect more of this to happen again in uh, in the in the near future especially inside the eu well uh, i mean i hope you're wrong um especially with regard to to martial law but uh no maybe yeah, not I as dramatic see. as martial law but but <laughs> right. elites are getting jumpy I mean, we. I mean, again, Romania. We just had an, an a presidential election cancelled. That's mm -hmm. that's a that's a pretty tough measure, right? Um, and this is this doesn't. It's not a sign of of internal cohesion and strength. Just as declaring no. martial law is not. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, I think there are certainly bumpy, cracks bumpy in right this ahead. sort of. What, what was it? Blinken called it earlier in this episode. This happy Western family or something like that. But yeah, uh, yeah it's. Um, it's certainly interesting times that we live in. And uh, on that note, thank you for watching and listening. And do let us know your comments and what you'd like us to cover in future episodes. What parts of the world do you think are underserved by YouTube and all of the other podcasts that you listen to that you'd like us to take a look at? And thank you very much. Thank you, John.